The East India Company was a private company, just like the Massachusetts Bay Colony in a way had originally been a private company. Both, of the, both Massachusetts and the East India Company had gotten their start as private ventures uh, during the early 17th century, the early 1600s. Um, and this was because at the time England was a small country on the edge of Europe. It's an island unto its own. It does not have the resources to be trying to, to be colonizing the rest of the world. Um, however, there were private adventurers of various kinds who were willing to try and find economic effort opportunities in various parts of the globe. And so they would ask for charters from the king or queen to go out and do that. So the East India Company was one of these companies. They said, we're going to go to India, to the East India, to the East Indies, to Indone what's now Indonesia, to China. Um, and we are going to seek out trading opportunities there. Um, we are going to try and raise money to do this from other partners. Can we have permission to do this from the crown? So the crown said, sure. In fact, I'll give you a monopoly as an incentive because you're sticking your neck out on what, what looks like a very risky venture. You might not ever come back. You might lose your shirt on this venture. Um, so if you are successful, you're going to be able to make money for this, uh, from this at the crown's pleasure for a long time. Uh, if you fail, you know, England won't necessarily be blamed. England won't necessarily be financially on the hook for this. So OK. So the East India Company, it has some ups and downs at the beginning, but by the 18th century, it is an extraordinarily successful company that now has its fingers in the China trade, in, um, in collecting tax revenues in Eastern India, um, in, it, uh, it even has its own army in, in Eastern India. So, um, and, and they're trading, they're, they basically have a monopoly on all trade east of the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, in the 18th century. But w their most important commodity, I mean, fabrics were probably their most important commodity, but their most important single commodity was probably tea. And so t the only place that, that tea was being grown commercially uh, in the 18th century was in China. So, um, so the East India Company would be trading at Canton. Um, they would be, um, they would get shipments of various varieties of tea. They would take responsibility for bringing that tea back to London. Um, and from there, uh, various wholesalers and retailers would buy it from the East India Company because it had this exclusive monopoly on this valuable product. And they would then sell it all over England, all over Scotland, all over Ireland, uh, all over America, all over America. Russians drank tea, they had their own overland trade routes for it. By and large, continental Europe are not as big fans of tea. In England and America and, 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 and British American colonies, however, tea was the craze. And so often other European East India trading companies would be buying tea in China, but for the purposes of smuggling it into England to meet that demand. So people are crazy for tea um, in the 18th century, and, the, and smugglers and the East India Company were competing to get that tea into the hands of English tea drinkers and American tea drinkers in the 18th century. One thing the East India Company, however, could not do was bring its tea directly to America without having to go through some kind of middleman. So the Tea Act, a lot of people think that the Tea Act levied new taxes on the Americans. It didn't at all. Um, there were no new taxes involved in the Tea Act of 1773. All the, East in all the Tea Act of 1773 was going to do was going to be to make tea actually cheaper for Americans by eliminating some of the middlemen and allowing the East India Company um, certain privileges to send tea directly to America without paying certain duties and without having to uh, go through any middlemen. Now, so Americans should have been overjoyed by this, cheap tea. But there were going to be a couple of problems with the tea, with the, what this arrangement was going to do. First of all, a lot of those middlemen who are going to be cut out are American traders who used to be able to profit from the tea trade. Now, on the other hand, now, unfortunately, under the Tea Act, the, um, the tea trade is going to be in the hands of a certain select group of consignees, handpicked by the East India Company and its associates. And so this really looked like a kind of ugly um, thing, the, 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 distribu the distribution of favors and, and uh, uh, you know, to certain um, key cronies of the East India Company. This looked really worrisome. The other thing is one of the taxes that isn't taken off was the tax that Americans paid on all tea that they imported. That had been put in place in 1767 under the Townsend duties. It was the only remaining duty that hadn't been repealed. Um, you know, most of the other duties had been repealed in 1770, but the tax on tea still remained. And New York City and, and Philadelphia, for instance, had been boycotting all tea from the East India Company and only drinking smuggled tea instead uh, in protest of this tax. So now the Tea Act 
is really threatening the smugglers actually by saying, oh, well, we're going to make tea even cheaper, undercut the prices that smugglers can charge. And so, um, and so this was going to, this was really threatening the arrangement by saying, okay, now we are, uh, are going to enable t um, tea, the East India Company to sell dutied tea as cheaply as possible to American consumers, this was now going to, th th the threat was that this was going to be the only way that Americans could get tea and they were automatically going to have to pay this tax to the British. So the only things that you can do are either continue to boycott legal tea to, um, you know, to make to try and send these tea shipments back to England, which was technically illegal, but you could try to do it. Um, you know, those were really the only choices to try and find a way to refuse this. Otherwise, what they worried is if they accept this precedent of drinking monopoly duty tea, then the British Empire would say, okay, we can do this to any commodity that the, that, um, that are, that's being sent over from England to America. We'll put taxes on this, we'll grant new monopolies on that. Um, and all of a sudden, Americans were going to be paying out of uh, an extraordinarily amount out of pocket for taxes and for jacked up monopoly prices. Um, and this was going to be ju just something really worrisome. And so that's why the newspapers begin reacting to the Tea Act and saying, guys, we have a lot to worry about here. Um, let's make sure that none of this East India Company tea is landed in American cities. And so the East India Company was going to send shipments to Boston, to New York City, to Philadelphia, and to Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, and in all of those cities, the newspapers begin warning people, you know, l uh, let's resolve not to allow this tea to land. Let's do whatever we can to have it sent back. And that was, bo bo that was bo the Bostonians' first choice, was to send the tea back to London. Now, unfortunately, under customs regulations, it was technically illegal to do this unless you got special permission from the governor or somebody. Uh, and in Boston, the governor was unwilling to grant that special permission. Um, and so uh, at some point on December 16th, the Bostonians decide, okay, we're out of options here. The only way to make sure that this tea won't be landed and sold in America is to throw it into Boston Harbor. And that's what leads to the famous Boston Tea Party of December 16th, 1773.